Good morning and welcome to worship at Old South Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, on this first Sunday of January 2023. Uh, welcome um, on this day that is really quite warm um, out there and sunny. Uh, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Glad if you're here in our midst, um, gathered in the sanctuary, and also glad if you are joining us on Zoom or if you're watching this worship service in the days or weeks to follow on YouTube. You are welcome, and we are glad that you're here. If you are joining us remotely, and if you do not get the church uh, email, our bulletin uh, or program can be found on our website, uh, just like in the upper right-hand corner, uh, for worship materials. And again, welcome. I want to offer all of you on this warm day a warm welcome as we gather together as God's people on this first Sunday of the new year. So again, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. We'll begin as we normally do with a prelude, so I'll turn it over to Brad.
let all of creation praise the name of the Holy One. Let all of creation praise the name of the Holy One. Let all of creation praise the name of the Holy One. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, you gather us together as community, knitting us together with grace and mercy. In your presence, there is fullness of love, joy, hope, and peace. As we worship this day, may we feel your presence anew. Receive our praise, dwell in our midst, and create in us a heart that yearns for you. In the name of Emmanuel, we pray and continue our prayer with the prayer he taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Cynthia. And now we will sing together, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You'll find it uh, in the Pilgrim Hymnal, number 120. It is also, the words are on the sheet that's attached um, on the back of the announcement sheet. And during the hymn, you are invited to come forward if you would like to, and to um, light a candle and to say a personal silent prayer. <laughs>
Today is really quite an amazing Sunday. Did you know? For today's worship, I could have focused on this being the first Sunday after Christmas, or I could have focused on this being the naming of Jesus Sunday, or I could choose to focus on Epiphany Sunday, since Epiphany takes place between today and next Sunday. I had a hard time choosing. Ask Cynthia, who was waiting. Have you chosen the hymns yet? No, because I don't know which Sunday I'm going to celebrate and observe. So in the end, I focused on this being the Sunday before Epiphany. So here is our focus scripture of the day. It is a familiar one for those of you who, especially if you attend church around Christmas time. So I would invite you to listen in and to listen carefully for there might be something a little bit new you've never noticed before. And besides today is a quiz day, which I know everyone loves quiz day. So, just be ready. So listen in. This is Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, for so it has been written oh, uh, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd the people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country, by another road. Here ends our reading from scripture. May God bless us with understanding. Amen. So when I decided to go the epiphany route for today and focus on Matthew 2 verses 1 through 12, I thought about titling today's message, You're Doing It Wrong. <laughs> But that sounded just a little too negative, uh, so I didn't. I know many of you already know that I have some issues with how we treat Christmas. Jamming all of the good parts together as if that's how the story goes. Except that the story doesn't really go together. Luke and Matthew wrote very different stories that don't actually fit neatly together as if there's some grand puzzle or two nicely complementary narratives. Although that's what we do. We cram them together. Mary, Joseph, baby, star, shepherds, angels, wise people, gifts, animals, manger, a stable, and a mean old innkeeper year after year. There isn't, even, there isn't even an innkeeper. There's just no room at the inn. For all we know, they just saw no vacancy sign in the front and that's all there was to it. But I think that it's important. And despite some of you already probably signing, sighing and perhaps even grumbling a bit under your breath, that we face up to the weird way we do this 
year after year in smushing together a Christmas story that doesn't really fit. Maybe it will make all of you feel a better, or at least a little bit better, that I do this at home as well with my little nativity scenes around my house. They too have all those characters all together, all in one place, even though they don't really fit together. Now I won't go into all the various details of where we go astray, but let's take the Magi, since that's today's story. And let's have ourselves a little New Year's Day quiz, okay? Now, I just, I'm going to, I have, a, I have, what, six questions, six questions, um, and don't, um, if you're here in person, you don't need to yell out any answers or anything, just make note of them in your head, and then I'll let you know it's difficult for those of us who join us online, because they can't really hear you, and sometimes I forget to parrot what you say, so just make note, and we'll, we'll see how we do, um, and again, just, just six questions. Number one. How many magi or wise men, um, magi is the word uh, from the Greek, um, how many magi, wise men were there? Two, were the magi kings? Three, what were their names? Four, they followed the star directly to where Jesus was, true or false? Five, another true or false. They came from far away. And six, another true or false. They had a hard time fitting into the stable, you know, with all those animals and the shepherds and, the, and all that stuff. All right, ready for some answers? Number one, how many? We don't know. We don't know. It doesn't say. Really, go back and look. It doesn't say. At some point, the idea came along that there were three because that's how many gifts were given and presented to the baby Jesus. But the text doesn't actually say. There could have been two. There could have been 10. Were they all men? We don't know that either. Although when you think about the gifts that they brought, not one of them especially useful for a young family, we might safely assume that they were indeed all men. I'll let you laugh at that for a moment. Let's go on to number two. Were they kings? No, they were likely astrologers. Magi actually means astrologer, astrologers, that's a plural, or magicians. Three, what were their names? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> and the names that you think of, right, the Balthazar and the Melchior, that kind of stuff, that's not there. That came later. We don't know. Four, they followed the star directly to where Jesus was. False. They made it as far as Herod's and then asked for directions. It's interesting that we consistently leave out this part of the story. Herod doesn't fit neatly into our adorable nativity scenes. He was, after all, a really terrible guy. So we leave him out. But should we? The Magi, the Magi went to see Herod first. That's as far as they got initially anyway. And Herod consulted with the chief priests and the scribes. And uh, they came up with Bethlehem as the likely place to find this new baby king of the Jews. It's only after the consulta consultation with Herod that the star appears again for them and directs them to where Jesus is. Five, they came from far away. True. This is also important. They came from far away and very, very, very extremely likely were not Jews. Matthew is setting up a theme at the very start of the story. This, may, this baby may be the king of the Jews, but he's a whole lot more than that too. 
six. They had a hard time fitting into the stable with all the shepherds and the animals and stuff. False. Do I hear some muttering in the, in the background, the choir? There isn't a stable. Did anyone notice there's no stable in this story? No stable at all, not any store, not any stable. There's a house. They visit Jesus in his house. Anyone have a house as part of the nativity scene at, in your living room? Anyone? Anyone have a house? I don't either. I'll admit it. I don't. Then maybe it's time to give it a try. So how did you do? How'd you do on the quiz? Okay. You've been listening over the years, maybe. But you might be asking, why is this important? Why do I need to know this? Why do I need to observe this? Why do we talk about this almost every year after Christmas? One reason is that we do a lot of myth-making when it comes to Jesus. And that myth-making starts right at the beginning. Now, I don't want to say that we need to eliminate all of that myth-making, that you need to kind of redo your nativity scenes, make a note to yourself, like in the calendar next year, I'll do it differently. Not necessarily saying that. But I do think that we need to think more critically about the myth-making that we do. And by that, I mean forming Jesus into what we want, what we would like Jesus to be, what Christians generally would prefer Jesus to be, rather than allowing Jesus to form us into what Jesus needs us to be. These are important things to consider and ponder as we start the year, as we say goodbye to Christmas, but as we allow ourselves to, all, to kind of hold Christmas as we move into the new year, how do we allow Jesus to form us rather than the other way around? The other thing that's important is to appreciate that each of the gospel writers has their own take on Jesus. Each is writing not so much an historical account of Jesus, but a theological one. And for the next few weeks, we'll be spending time with Matthew. Matthew writes his own distinctive account. In his distinctiveness, it may very well be that there were no magi at all. But these characters serve a purpose in a theological way. At the same time, though, while we lift up the Magi and set them in our nativity scenes, you know, with a stable, even though they didn't visit Jesus in the stable, it was in the house. So they don't really, we, we sort of, we, we lift them up, we set them in our, in, our, in our scenes. If we had a Christmas pageant, they'd be there too but they don't really fit very well with the young family in a stable. And then we also, that we fail to lift up and to include that other guy, Herod. Anybody have Herod in your, in your nativity scene or a guy over on the side? No, we don't. For Matthew, it's crucial to understand from the very beginning, the threat the threat that Jesus, even as a small infant, as a child, posed to those in power. Here we have Herod terrified of a small child. He is so terrified that the next part of the story involves the slaughter of the innocents. When Herod, because the Magi did not return to him and tell him exactly where this amazing child actually was, Herod ordered the killing of all the male babies under the age of two in and around Bethlehem. That's how terrified Herod, the man in charge, was. Now, we may cut ourselves a bit of slack. Who wants that to be a part of your nativity scene in your living room? But we are reminded of how important it is that we connect and reconnect 
with this story, with these stories on a regular basis? What is exactly, what is it exactly that Matthew is trying to convey here at the start of the Jesus story? One of the first is very likely the contrast between Herod and the strange people from afar. Herod, and this is Herod the Great, Roman ruler of the area, half Jewish himself. He is different. He is a different Herod than the one that we'll meet at the end of Jesus's earthly life. He is terrified at the news of the birth of a new king of the Jews. He is terrified and supposedly all of Jerusalem with him. He's so terrified that he's prepared to slaughter innocent children. And then we have these magi, these strange people from far away. These are not Jewish and yet are so eager to greet this very young future king of the Jews that they are willing to travel mile after mile after mile to see him and to offer gifts and recognition of who they believe him to be. And they don't even stay very long. They visit, they present their gifts and off they go. How many miles did you travel today to gather here in this place to offer your gifts in recognition of who Jesus was and is? It's worth absorbing at the start of this story, this contrast that Matthew sets up for us. We also ought to ask ourselves about our own attitude and approach to how we perceive who this Jesus is and how Jesus calls us. Now, in these days, are we terrified? Are we fearful? of what Jesus might ask us to do or to be? Or are we so overwhelmed by joy that we are prepared to do things we may not feel capable of doing? How are we beginning this year, each of us and all of us together? Let us take a moment. Let us take a moment and reflect and ponder and be honest with ourselves, each of us and all of us together. Do we begin this year with fear? Or do we begin this year with overwhelming joy? Do we begin this year with fear or with overwhelming joy? It's important to know that. It's important to know that for each of us and all of us together. And so if you're not feeling overwhelming joy, let us take a moment to open our hearts to the overwhelming joy that Jesus is ready to share with us. Let us open our hearts to the overwhelming joy that Jesus is prepared to share with us. Praise be to God. Amen.
When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Then they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We too are overwhelmed with joy at this season and at the birth of Christ. We too offer our gifts in celebration of this joy that we share in our faith. Our gifts to outreach this month are again for Ukrainian relief. Our gifts do make a difference. And I'd like to share excerpts from two letters of thanks we have recently received. The first one is a local. The people in our community are in fact, are indeed in need as reflected in this letter from the Hollowell Food Pantry. Thank you for your church's recent donation of $600. We continue to see an increase in the number of people who are experiencing food insecurity. We provided Thanksgiving baskets to 45 local households. And that's more than 45 individuals. The incredible generosity of your congregation will help us to meet these needs. On behalf of the individuals and families we serve, I would like to express how grateful we are for your support, which makes a huge difference 
in people's lives. Sincerely, Vicki Gabrion, Director. The other letter is from the United Church of Christ from Reverend John, Dr. John Dorhauer, the General Minister and President. In response to the gift we gave recently for disaster relief um, following the floods and hurricanes and rain in many parts of the country, including Florida. Dear friends at Old South Congregational Church, thank you for your generous donation to the United Church of Christ to support international disaster relief. Because of your kindness, we will help people rebuild their communities and bring comfort to their lives. Your love of neighbor will be made tangible through your gift. Thank you again for spreading God's hope, peace, and love through your financial assistance as the United Church of Christ continues to build a just world for all. In faith, John Dorhauer. So please remember your gifts make a difference and celebrate this season with the overwhelming joy of the gift we have been given. Thank you very much, Christine. We do come to our the time of our worship when we consider our gifts. We consider all the various gifts and all the various ways that we give of ourselves through the gifts that we've been given. We take a moment, I think, especially on this first Sunday of the year to consider perhaps um, some different gifts that we may be perceiving in ourselves and the various ways that we are called to be church and individuals part of this church. So let us take a moment to consider all the ways through which we give and share of the blessings that we have been given. And we also take a moment to consider our financial support of this uh, community of faith. And as we come together and think of in a way, in this way, in terms of our financial support, um, if you do have a financial gift that you would like to share today, if you're here in the sanctuary, you may come forward in a moment and put that offering in one of the offering plates. There's one here on the chair, and then there's one here in the front pew. If you are joining us uh, remotely, you may mail in uh, donations to the church office or send them directly to Wendy at her home, or you can use a credit card. Uh, and there's a link to do all of that that's on our website. Let us uh, take a moment and prayerfully consider the many gifts and the various ways through which we seek to support this expression of the body of Christ.
as we normally do, we'll have a little bit of silence uh, before I lead us together. So I would encourage you to take that time to lift up into God's presence those things that live on your heart and as well to open your heart and to hear and to listen for God's voice um, there. So let us take some time to be in prayer. And again, we'll start with silence and then I will lead us together. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you that in the fullness of time you came among us in Jesus and visited us with your grace. We thank you that you forever hold us in your loving embrace. We are reminded in this season of the complexities of your story and the various responses to the birth of Jesus from profound and deep fear and suspicion to joy so overflowing that it could not be contained. Help us, O oh God, to ponder anew where our own hearts can be found in this season. Are we ourselves, are we as a group feeling fearful or are we joyful? And if we are teetering toward the fearful, help us, O oh God. Help us to be open to the joy you offer to us and for us. And help us to live in the midst of the joy you so graciously bestow upon us each and every day. As we consider the new year upon us, we are aware of the fragility of life. Make us aware, O oh God, of the prayer of the psalmist who said, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May we indeed in these days grow in wisdom and in strength. And in this time of prayer, we lift up into your care those for whom time has become a burden and for, and for whom time seems to stand still. We lift up those whose strength is diminishing. We lift up those who can no longer engage the world beyond their own walls and are confined to their homes or in a care facility. We lift, up, we lift up those who suffer from illnesses, which slowly destroy the mind and or body and quietly but persistently steal a person from his or her family. We lift up those who grieve, keenly feeling the loss of a loved one. And we lift up in prayer those who do not have a proper place to call home, food to sustain them, or clean water to drink. We lift up in prayer those who have been driven from their home, and as well those who live in the midst of chaos and violence. Be with us, O oh God, always, and help us to be the people you call us to be. Be with us and strengthen us, for there is much work to be done in this world, much love to share, much joy to be a part of and to offer ourselves. 
Be with us, O oh God. Strengthen us anew to be your people, that we may be people who are overwhelmed with joy and so overwhelmed that we cannot help but to share it. In the name of Jesus the Christ, the one born anew in our hearts in the season, we pray. Amen. And now we'll sing together our final hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. We'll be singing the New Century version in the Black Hymnal, number 140, 154. You can also find the words on the back of the announcements page. Mm -hmm. to the end of our worship this day may we be prepared to be the people we're called to be as we move out into the world as we seek to share the love and the joy we have experienced go now with these words of blessing may we remember the magnificent acts of the holy one may we proclaim the wondrous ways of our god may love be our compass and mercy our guide Go into the world as kinfolk of the Christ who and trust people who trust in the faithfulness of the one who calls, who comes, and who companions with us. Go in peace. Go for peace. Amen. Amen.